service from Riverside Evangelical Church. We pray that as we worship and explore the scriptures together, that we will be drawn closer to God and transformed into the image of his son Jesus. Welcome to this week's Sunday service from Riverside Church in Ayr. I'm Kieran, and it's great to be able to worship with you during this time. Whether you're a regular attendee or viewer here at Riverside, or whether you're new, we hope you enjoy your time with us. You can find out more about our church, including contact details at our website or on Facebook. Today, from the comfort of our homes, we've got worship from Jenny, Ross and Beth and Stuart, and input from Sarah, Cameron, Phil, John and Joanna. Lizzie is going to be continuing our series in Exodus and we'll be speaking on Exodus chapter 3, Hearing God's Call. A big thank you to everyone who contributed and helped pull this together for us today. We hope that you will be encouraged and blessed in your time with us. Hello, thank you for joining us today. I hope you're all well and that you're enjoying your new sense of freedom, seeing family and friends, albeit outside and from a distance. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, the world is going through uncertain times at the moment with the coronavirus pandemic. There has been some encouraging numbers reported and I pray that this will continue and that the virus won't spike again. Thank you, Father, for bringing us this far and give us the strength, patience and wisdom to get to the end of the chaos. I pray for those who are crushed in spirit and are struggling at this time and also for those who are isolated from family and friends and the community due to health conditions. I also pray for those who are mourning at this difficult time. May you let them know your comforting hand and that they will put their trust in you during this dark time. I pray we may be a light and an encouragement to others during this time. We thank you for everything you have done for us this far and for what you will continue to do for us in the future. Help us, Lord to honour you in everything that we do. In Jesus' name, Amen. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade by your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor will the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore.
Good morning Riverside, uh, a very warm welcome if you're just visiting us on Facebook or YouTube um, or if you're catching up with the service a little bit later in the day. My name is Lizzie and I'm a member of the congregation at Riverside and this is my first attempt at a video presentation. I have my iPad precariously balanced on a number of packing boxes, we've just moved house, and I've got my laptop also precariously balanced on a number of packing boxes. Um, it's got my notes on it just off to the left, so if my eyes keep sliding off, um, I'm just checking over my notes. We're continuing our series on Exodus. So Gordon got us started off a couple of weeks ago and he gave us an overview of Exodus um, and some lessons from chapter one. And Ian followed up um, last week with um, a message from chapter two. So if your brain isn't completely addled by many months in lockdown, um, you probably already have figured out that we're moving on this week to look at chapter three. So a quick recap for you. The Israelites are under bondage um, to the Egyptians. They're the Egyptian slaves and they have been for hundreds of years and they're crying out to God for a deliverer. And into this um, prayer steps Moses, a man better marked out for a deliverer of Israel you could not have found. He has this dramatic birth story where he miraculously escaped from Pharaoh and he's been raised in the courts of Egypt. So he has wealth, he has education and he has relational ties. He's also managed to maintain his Israelite identity and his allegiance to the Israelite people. So he has a foot in both camps, as it were. I wonder if Moses had a sense of his own destiny. I wonder if he even felt a little bit untouchable sometimes. At the age of 40, Acts um, in the New Testament says that Moses was a powerful man, a man of power in words and deeds. And Moses one day um, is walking among his own people and he sees an Egyptian mistreating an Israelite. And his sense of justice is offended and checking that there's nobody around to see, he acts and he kills the Egyptian. And this is Moses's undoing. His secret gets out and Pharaoh wants him dead. And interestingly, the Egyptian, sorry, the Israelite people also reject Moses as their leader. Perhaps they've had enough of violent rulers. And Moses, the prince of Egypt, finds himself fleeing to the desert. And he runs as far as the Midianite people. And that's where we're gonna pick up with him in chapter three. The Bible tells us very little about Moses's thoughts and feelings. I imagine this would be a very traumatic transition for Moses. He's lost um, all his relational networks. Um, he's lost his position. He's lost his wealth. He's got nothing. He's got no one to recommend him. And he's failed in this destiny to be Israel's deliverer. And he's murdered a man. We don't really know how Moses feels about that. 
in the years to come. So here he is in Midian and he's tending his father-in-law's sheep. And when we pick up the story in chapter 3, 40 years have passed. So Moses has settled. There's no indication that he plans to go back to Egypt. And again, we don't know if he's content with his lot. He's married, he has children, he's clearly got some sort of rhythm of life in, in looking after um, his father-in-law's sheep. Is he content and happy with that? Does he have regrets? Does he miss his Israelite and Egyptian relations? Does he feel like he messed up or missed out on his calling? We don't know. We're not told. But he is about to have a day like no other. Walking out with the sheep, Moses sees a curious sight. He sees a bush that is burning, but not burning up. And he turns aside to have a look at this curious sight and a voice speaks to him. And this voice says that it is the voice of God, the voice of the God of his forefathers. And this voice has a mission for him. This voice tells Moses that he's to go back into Egypt, that he's to win the trust of the Israelite nation and that he's to lead the people out of Egypt and into the promised land. Let's read together from chapter three. Now Moses was pasturing the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvellous sight. Why the bush is not burned up? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said also, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters for I am aware of their sufferings. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I've seen the oppression with which the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you. And this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you've brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. Then Moses said to God, behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now the title for this talk is Hearing God's Call. And when Ian first gave me that title and I first looked at the passage, I very naturally looked at God's call to Moses. Moses was given a job to do. But when I thought about it more, I thought that actually the primary call in this passage is not to Moses. The primary call in this passage comes through Moses to the people of Israel. It can be really helpful when we're studying a book of the Bible to consider who wrote it and why. Who was it written to? What was the author's intended purpose? And the book of Exodus isn't written as a book to individuals about how to hear the voice of God. The book of Exodus is an origin story. The first five books of the Bible were written to tell the Israelite people as a nation who they are, where they have come from, 
who their God is, what their God is like and what his promises to them are. In Exodus 3, there's some really remarkable revelations about the character of God. And at that time, they would be particularly countercultural. At a time where God was seen to be on the side of the powerful and the strong, then here is a God who says he is on the side of the weak. He says, I've surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters, for I am aware of their suffering. And he's not just interested, but he wants to act on their behalf. He says, so I've come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land. And this God, unlike other gods, doesn't need to be sustained by human gifts and sacrifices. This God is self-sufficient. And that was the miracle of the burning bush, was that the fire required no fuel to keep it going. I am who I am, says God, an all-powerful creator and sustainer of life. But perhaps the most remarkable thing about this God is that once he's rescued these people, he doesn't intend to go back to where he came from. He wants to dwell with his people, not because he needs them, but because he wants to be with them. Jumping ahead to the instructions that God gave the Israelites in the desert at the end of Exodus, in Exodus 29, it says this, I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. One commentator writes this, This was Yahweh's deliberate purpose behind the whole Exodus undertaking to be their indwelling God. There's a very famous piece of artwork that came out of Russia by the iconographer Andrei Rublev, and it was created in the 15th century, and it still hangs in um, Moscow in Russia today. And the icon is a picture taken from a story in Genesis, and it's where three messengers from God come, and they come to visit Abraham, and those messengers from God are often understood to be the three persons of the Trinity. And Rublev's icon is called the Trinity and it shows a scene from that story where Abraham cooks a meal for the strangers, the messengers from God, and then he retreats and he leaves them to eat. And the picture shows these three persons of the Trinity eating together. And Richard Rohr describes it, that they're eating together in infinite hospitality and utter enjoyment between themselves. We can see the respect between the three as they share their meal together from a common bowl. Now the icon is absolutely full of imagery and the idea was to, to give people insights into the persons of the Trinity. But there's just one aspect of the icon I want to draw your attention to. And that's the way that the, seat, the, um, the people seated are arranged around the table. They seem to create space for the observer as if they want to draw the observer into the picture. There's even a suggestion that one of the people is pointing towards an open fourth space at the table. Is it possible that we are invited to join the Trinity in their infinite, perfect relating with one another? Well, we don't know if that's what the artist intended, but there's no conjecture when it comes to scripture because that message is woven through the entirety of scripture from before Exodus right the way through to Revelation. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and I will give you rest. But once we're rested, he says, abide with me, stay with me. And we have all these intimate relational metaphors about being family, about being children of God, about being the bride of Christ. We are invited to come and dwell and be with the Trinity, with the person of God. But what does that actually mean? In practice, what might that look like? How can we enjoy that experience more in our day-to-day -day lives? I'm just scrolling up. I've got two questions um, that I thought might be helpful to ask ourselves. 
And these are drawn from Moses' own response um, to his encounter with God. And the first question is this, where in your life are you taking time to turn aside? Life tends to build up pace pretty quickly. Um, we have a preoccupation with to-do lists, we've got the demands of the people around us, um, and the idea of kind of worship and wonder can quite quickly be shuffled off to the side. But the beautiful response of Moses, I must turn aside now and see this marvellous sight, might be something that we want to consider more often in our own lives. Jesus took time out just to commune with his father quietly, just him and his father together. And anyone that's tried that or tries it on a regular basis will know it's surprisingly difficult. We have different seasons in life and some of those make it easier or harder to take regular time out. But I can tell you that whatever your season in life, it won't happen unless you're intentional about it. It is hard to break away from the normal routine and to still ourselves before God. So you might have to sit and plan and diary in, how am I going to do that? Might it be a regular time and place every day? Or if I've got a very busy family and work life, might I just have to snatch a few minutes here and there through the week, but maybe have some time an evening or weekend where I can sit for a little bit longer and be with my Father God. The other temptation we've got is to fill up that time as much as possible. We live in a culture that is driven by results and productivity and we unconsciously I think adopt those values into our faith and we find it very hard just to sit quietly before God. We feel like we've got to have a list of things to pray through or it's January the 3rd and we're eight chapters behind in our resolution to read through the Bible in a year. It's okay just to sit in God's presence. We might find that things like journaling or reflecting on a piece of scripture or having a quiet time of worship will help direct us, um, our hearts and our minds, and more towards God. But don't feel the need to have a big to-do list that you tick off. I find it very challenging in the Exodus story that God didn't speak to Moses until he had turned aside. The scriptures say this, When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush. The invitation was there in the form of the burning bush. But if Moses hadn't turned aside to look, is it possible that God would not have spoken to him? Do we miss hearing the voice of God because we don't turn aside? Moses said, I must turn aside now and see this marvellous sight. Where are you turning aside? The second question that I think could help us respond to this calling to be with God is this. Where in your life are you taking off your shoes? There's a huge mistake, in my opinion, that Christians make of separating out their spiritual life from their normal life and giving their activities value accordingly. So we think of things like evangelism, prayer, Bible reading, going to church. These are spiritual activities and we expect to meet God in them. But other activities like our leisure time, our work life, our household chores, our time with friends are somehow seen as secondary to that unless we can shove in some sort of missional aspect to them. But God is in all things and through all things. In him we live and move and have our being. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. God is in every aspect of our lives. There's a 19th century author, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, nearly said Browning Barrett there, um, who wrote about our tendency to split off the supernatural and the natural. And she wrote this. Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush of fire with God but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The rest sit round and pluck blackberries. We can be so busy looking for some sort of supernatural experience that we miss God in the natural, in the everyday. Earth's crammed with heaven and every common bush of fire with God, 
but only he who sees takes off his shoes. What would it look like for you to take off your shoes? Maybe that's something you could reflect on today. In taking off his shoes, Moses acknowledged that God was present. He took time to listen and to take his cues from God. Where might God be in our day? What are those life-giving moments? From the warmth of a hot drink to the kind words of a friend. How often do we stop to enjoy and thank God for those? When we meet with others, do we recognise that God is present with them and in them? That they are God's workmanship? That he is at work in their lives? Do we take time to listen to their stories, to learn from them? Or are you like me, a little bit too quick to do all the talking? Do we judge people or dismiss people? Or do we recognise that in the presence of others we are on holy ground and we need to take off our shoes? How often do you take time to marvel at the beauty of the world around you? From the stars in space to the breath in your body. Earth's crammed with heaven, but only he who sees takes off his shoes. The Beatitudes say this, blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. I was really interested when Stevie Ray read this verse a few weeks ago in the online service and he read it from the message and the message version interprets it like this. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. And that in a nutshell, I suppose, is, is what I've been trying to explore with this talk. That as we turn aside and take time to dwell and be with God and get our internal world correct right before him, then we're so much more aware of his presence in the rest of our lives. And it's out of this that we have something meaningful to offer um, the rest of the world. We're quite good at talking about what we've been saved from. We can talk about being separated from God and saved from sin. I think sometimes we've got less of an idea what we were actually saved for. What are we inviting people into when we share our faith with them? The first generation of Israelites never made it to the promised land. In a way, that's quite shocking. Whatever heart attitudes they had learned in Egypt, they were unable to overcome them. They couldn't trust God to lead them. And when they got to the promised land, they ended up turning back into the desert and wandering there for 40 years. That whole generation died out without fully experiencing everything that God had for them. It was the next generation that went into the promised land and enjoyed the good things that God had for them. God has called us to come and be with him. That's our primary calling. Everything else flows out of that. God has called us to come and be with him. But in Revelation, he says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He waits on us to open our lives to him. Let's just take a minute to pray. Lord God, we want to experience all that you have for us. We want to have life to the full. But sometimes it's hard to turn aside, to open ourselves up to you, to create quiet places and to recognise you in the everyday. Open our eyes, God, to see you more and help us to walk deeper in to the fullness of life that you have for us. In Jesus' name. Amen.
check out our YouTube channel or Facebook pages. Or for more information about Riverside or ways to give to the church, please visit our webpage riverside-air.org. Thanks for listening.